Supla Santa, signo del espero, con lectillas falsa y batalando, cae la pide, crezcas la afero, per labor de la esperanto, fortescaras, muro y de miliano, pinter la popo de dividida, serpis altos, la obstina y baro, per la santa, amor dispartida. Mi nombre es Anas. Mi nombre es Neil. Mi nombre es Ralph Dume. Mi nombre es Fecio Cesarano. Mi nombre es Renata Ventura. I really think that a hidden appeal of Esperanto is the fact that by people participating in a language that somebody invented consciously. It's a way that people participate in the act of human creativity. And I think that's what gives people a thrill, even though they don't come out and say it. I mean, to create an entire language is fundamentally an expression of human creative power. And I think that's the secret of its appeal. Behold, Esperanto. But where did it come from? Meet L. L. Zamenhof, born in Poland in 1859. When Ludwig Lazarus Zamenhof was born, his hometown was still part of the Russian Empire, and he considered Russian and Belarusian to be his native tongue. Ludwig also eventually learned German, Yiddish, French, English, and several other languages. He believed that conflicts between ethnic groups in his hometown could be traced back to miscommunication and the lack of a single common language. This childhood idea struck with him for years, even during his time in medical school. By 1878, he felt he'd found a solution to the world's language problem. Instead of choosing an existing language to become the world's standard, why not just create a new one? Today we call this language Esperanto. Here's how it works. As a created language, Esperanto doesn't have the irregular rules of grammar or syntax found in other languages. Ludwig used existing words. Around 70% of Esperanto vocabulary comes from Romance languages. All of the rules for creating words and conveying meaning in Esperanto are consistent. This makes Esperanto very easy to learn. I tried to learn Italian and Spanish and um you know, I was stymied, you know, I, I got only so far, I never achieved a, a high level um, because of the irregularities. You know, it's, it's very easy to learn the patterns, the, the uh, conjugations and the, the typical patterns, but there are so many exceptions. Um, so I, I, I hit a roadblock with, with those things. When I encountered Esperanto and I found that there are no exceptions, all nouns end in O. Now you know everything there is to know about the endings of nouns in Esperanto. No exceptions. I said, this is for me. I've been very lucky in Copenhagen. There are a lot. Um, now here in New York, where I'm now, uh, I found that I was lucky to find uh, two persons. Um, but compared to Copenhagen, which is a, a smaller town, I think the community of Esperanto amongst, I mean, at least amongst young people, are, does not seem to be that big. But I know that there are other uh, cities in, I think it's in Eastern Europe, where you have a lot of Esperanto speakers. So I think it, it, it really depends on, on where you are. You know, as far as the Esperanto Club of New York, I would say that I've met somewhat over a hundred people that have come to the club at one time or another. And of those hundred people, I would suspect that they were born in about 20 different countries. and. So, so half of the Esperanto movement are actually people who are activists, a half of the New York Esperanto movement. Totally not true. Eighty percent of American Esperantists were born in the United States. But, uh, but at least fifty percent of the Esperanto speakers that are in New York City were born in Russia, China, Japan, Iran. These, these are the ones that I, that I know r right now. Um, Colombia, uh, so you're, and uh, 
in most cases, in nine out of ten cases, the Esperanto speakers that were active were already active in the country that they were born in. They were already active Esperanto speakers. Some, most young people, they learn it through the internet and then they, they speak it perfectly and they, they had never met an Esperanto speaker. But how universal is Esperanto? Will native French, German and Spanish speakers be able to understand some choice phrases? Let's find out. Mia filo havas hamstron. La hamstro nomijas Fred. Your son has a hamster? Yes. And its name is Fred. What did you pick out there? It looks like French and English combined. Spanish. And Spanish also, <laughs> yeah. Mia patro havas hundon. La hundo nomijas Roxy. He's got a dog. He has, okay. How do you know that? <laughs> I don't know. It just sounds like a lot of words you have in European languages. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of the point, right? <laughs> I know it's from German because I'm a, a German speaker and in German it's Hund. Hund, okay, right. So, the theory works surprisingly well. But practically, what use is Esperanto? Some primary schools teach the language as part of a pilot project. The belief is that a grounding in Esperanto makes other languages easier to learn. Hey saluto, hey saluto, chi Chiavi, non mi devas iri, non mi devas iri, ci srevi, ci srevi. Parents were sceptical, but after a term's teaching, they're impressed. The children were so far advanced that they were able to use the right grammar for colours and different numbers of objects that they were describing in the class. You take Chinese the way they write. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's different. Um, but then again, you, uh, I mean, we also have to look at, if I now look at what's available, then I can say Esperanto is available and there are a couple of other languages available that are, that are meant to be universal languages. So from what there is to choose from right now, I would say, well, I've, I've been recently been looking and maybe now I'm also a little bit, you know, favored because I've been studying Esperanto. Um, but, uh, but I think it, uh, it's, it's good for now. But if there is someone in the future who builds a new language, which has also a very good logic, makes it easy to learn, and makes it easier maybe for, for more people to pronounce and all that, then I would be open to it. It's, it's fonts or it's fountains or it's sources. Esperanto is a, 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 a phenomenon of European linguistics. It's like it is a European language in that respect that it is it is uh, all of its roots are taken from European languages. Its grammar is similar to a, a generally European model. So in that respect you'd have to say that it is a, a European language in, in that in by structurally. Um, there are two reasons for that. Um, one is that Zamenhof, the man who created um, the language, he knew a lot of languages, he didn't know them all. You know, he knew the, almost the whole range of European languages. He didn't know Asian languages and African languages and, and others. Um, but even if he had, um, um, it wouldn't really make coherent... Um, I mean, you, you could conceivably create an Esperanto using um, roots and grammatical structures from the many different language families. But it would not be a coherent whole. Um, there, there's the, you've heard of the um, Indo-European language family which is the parent family of almost all the European languages. A few not, Hungarian and Finnish, and a few are not. But aside from those few, all of those European languages that exist today come from a common parent. Um, and, you know, because of that, they share structures, and it's, it, it's, it, it, you can make a coherent, uh, learnable entity by appealing to those structures and generalizing those structures. Like I said, you could conceivably um, bring in structures from whatever parent language is, is the analog to Indo-European amongst African languages. You could do that. Um, it would be harder to learn, though, and you'd defeat one of the great uh, benefits of Esperanto. So it is true to say, though, that someone who, whose native language is not an Indo-European language will have a harder time learning Esperanto than someone whose native language is, a, is an Indo-European language. That is true. Um, but, but by the same token, that person will have an easier time learning Esperanto than he or she would have had learning one of the ethnic 
languages among the Indo-European family. So, you know, um, for, you know, for coherence purposes, um, it, 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 it I, I will say that it is, uh, it, it's a, a, a good, it's a benefit to Esperanto that it, it draws only from the Indo-European family, but it is, it is um, suitable for use as an interlanguage for people from all, all around the world. I, you know, I, I, in, I go back to the room, the little chat room that I mentioned before where I, um, I, I know my friend from Kazakhstan is in there. Um, I meet many people from, from many continents in there who sometimes, uh, you know, ha have, they, they don't know any European languages except Esperanto. So it's, it's kind of a bridge to the European languages. So like I say, structurally, yes, it's a European phenomenon, but it, it's a, it's a, well, linguistically it's a European phenomenon, but philosophically it's, it's applicable for anyone who considers him or herself a, you know, a, 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 a global, a global citizen, a cosmopolitan person. I think most people that don't like Esperanto don't know about it because uh, every time someone comes, oh, I don't like Esperanto, Esperanto is this, Esperanto is that, and it, they always say something that's not true. They, they heard it from someone, they heard it from a teacher who doesn't know about it, so they say, ah, Esperanto is this, Esperanto is that, and it's always wrong. So every time I talk to them about it and all the information, they're like, oh, okay, I didn't know it was like that, so this is a good idea. There are two basic sources of opposition. One is the opposition to the role of Esperanto as a universal language. Um, now, I'm not sure how intense this kind of opposition is, because most people at this point simply see it as unrealistic. So, if Esperanto really isn't a viable threat, then why would you need to oppose it so vehemently? I suppose some do, but I can't say that um, that uh, there's an awful amount of reason to, unless people are sort of outraged by unrealistic utopian projects. But uh, there's a second reason, which I think is a much deeper and, uh, and more telling, more ominous source of opposition to Esperanto, and that's not opposition to an unrealistic goal um, or to even an unrealistic ideology behind the goal. There's, a, there's an objection to the very existence of an artificially created language. And this opposition comes from a very deep-seated and very reactionary impulse um, which opposes the humanistic notion of, uh, of the ability to improve tradition by means of conscious intervention. We would call this organicism, if we were going to name it, as a um, philosophical ideology. But it's as if Esperanto were some kind of abomination that violates the basic order of things um, because of its consciously and artificially created. And in some cases, this gut-level hostility has its philosophical uh, justifications and uh, rationalizations. For example, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein was nauseated by the very idea of uh, Esperanto, and this gave him one more reason to oppose his rival philosopher, Rudolf Carnap, who actually had embraced and used Esperanto for social purposes. This gut-level hostility has a certain sort of right-wing, reactionary, uh, organicist, uh, a version behind it. Well, I have met uh, a few right-wing leaning Esperanto speakers, but I'm confident they are in a small minority. Uh, people who believe that the wealthy need to guide the world, that's a small minority in the Esperanto movement. Uh, the majority would agree that the large languages of the world got there by force. You know we have racism in the world, that the Western powers for several hundred years dominated Europe, uh, Africa. Every African that I meet says, oh, I can't speak in one of my local languages publicly. Uh, and there could be people from 20 different ethnic groups. They would begin to slaughter each other. That's what every Nigerian or Senegalese or Togo, everybody from those countries, they say, we can't speak, we have to speak in French. Insanity. Instead, these ethnic groups in Africa who are 